All right, we are live. Sorry for being, I think, a minute late. My internet just cut out and I just got everything back together. So for those of you who are new joining us, my name is Tiff and I'm the behavior manager at the Humane Society of Western Montana. And my puppy, Paya, will be demoing some skills for us today, but you'll see her in a moment. And today, well, every Wednesday at six o'clock, we have our puppy class where we present on a puppy topic. But tonight's topic applies to puppies and older dogs or any dogs, really. The topic is, oh dear, or preventing your dog from chasing deer, dogs, horses, wildlife, cars. If your dog chases something, this is, and you don't like it, this is gonna be the, the class for you. So as always, if you have questions throughout the session, please put them in the chat and um, off we go. So I wanna spend the first few minutes just talking about chasing and why this is such a difficult and complex topic to address. And to help me, I drew a little diagram here. So um, whether your dog chases uh, squirrels or bikes or cars or deer, the thing that is in play is your dog's prey drive. Prey drive in a nutshell is your dog's innate desire to go through with some step of the hunting process. So I drew this little diagram to show you. And um, in general, when an animal hunts, so a tiger, a dog, a wolf, there is a process involved. There's the tracking, the stalking, chasing, catching, killing, consuming. And depending on the dog breed or really dog individual, different traits are stronger than others. For example, hounds like to use their nose is the obvious thing people think about, but hounds typically, um, you know, all dogs are different. So obviously there are probably hounds that have successfully chased and killed deer and consumed them. But for the most part, hounds don't go all the way down this chain versus a lab likes to chase and catch, but they have a soft mouth if they're bred for hunting and they don't typically kill animals or consume the bird that they bring back to the hunter. Border collies are bred to really amplify that herding trait, not necessarily the catch and kill or else they wouldn't be good herding dogs. And then you have your terriers like your rat terrier who are really good at dismantling rodents and other prey animals, but they're not necessarily bred for the tracking or stalking part of it. So in general, prey drive is in play here when your dog chases something. Um, the other important thing to note is just because your dog shows some prey drive, it doesn't mean that they are a dangerous animal. For example, your dog may love to intensely chase the ball and really shake their head when they catch it, doesn't mean they're gonna do the same to a chicken. Or if your dog harms a chicken, it doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna harm a cat. And you're gonna figure, you're gonna learn why as we go through this session here. So a big theme of how we're going to solve the problem of chasing today is tapping into this in a way that we can control and structure. So I'm gonna just flip this here. And these are some activities that people deliberately do with their dogs that channel the prey drive. So for tracking, you have nose work, which is a really awesome sport, really fun to get into, you have tracking. And for this part, like the chase, catch, kill, um, dogs like to bite things or fetch things or shake their heads and have a tug toy. And then people like to play fetch or tug or what did I write? Sport pool, if you don't know what that is, I'll show you in a bit. Or, you know, play disc and compete in those venues. You don't need to compete or play seriously in any of these sports. But if you have a dog with you or a puppy with you right now, you probably know just from living with your dog that there are some activities they enjoy. And just know that play or playing with toys is a channeling of that prey drive in some way. So that's a little 101 on uh, just the, the root of the chasing. And it's gonna be really important as we talk about the solutions to the chasing problem too. So um, we're not gonna stop prey drive. So let's say your dog has successfully chased deer. The focus of how I train my dogs to not chase deer is not to teach them to not like chasing deer, it's to teach them to like something else even more and on the side, channeling that desire into something appropriate. So step one for the solution to preventing your dog from chasing or your puppy, teaching your puppy not to chase, which I'll talk about that part too, is to find what your dog likes the most. And especially if your dog has a desire to play, what play style they like the most. I will tell you for my dog, Bray, 
he loves tug more than anything in the world. I have a video of him biting a tug toy and I'm literally putting cheese in his nostrils and he loves cheese, um, but he will not drop the tug. He also loves chasing things. So disc, ball, things like that. He is also food motivated, but I use the um, tugs above uh, most other things that train him in these kinds of behaviors. My puppy Paya really loves food, and, but she loves some food more than others. And she's also really driven to chase. I think her desire to chase may actually be higher than Bray's, but she's still growing. And I use things like tug toys, balls, discs, and high value food. And I'll show you in a really hands-on way um, down the line, but figure out what your dog likes. And if you've watched the previous puppy seminar, you're gonna, this is gonna sound familiar, do not give it to them for free. That's the really important thing. If your dog loves, bacon and you give your dog a slice of bacon every morning because you love them, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But if your dog also chases deer, you're going to, hopefully at the end of this, you're going to see, I'm not going to tell you to stop giving your dog bacon. I'm just going to tell you to when to give your dog the bacon. So anything your dog loves the most, control it. Do not give it to them for free. All right, we're going to move past this step because I know you're going to want to see some demos. The other thing is once you figure out what your dog loves, particularly if it's something play related, you want to control it. So let's take a moment and let's just imagine a dog joyfully playing fetch in the field. You know, the owner is throwing the ball, dog brings it back, pick it up, throw it. You do that for a few minutes until the dog is tired, you go home. Nice tired dog who enjoyed playing fetch. There is nothing wrong with that picture. However, that you're not channeling in that picture, that dog is not learning to play fetch in a way that will help them learn not to chase deer. So now I'm gonna get Paya and I'm gonna show you some exercises you can do that makes use of your dog's natural desire to chase or play and structure it in a very controlled way. So I'm just gonna tilt my screen here. As always, Paya is in her pen so that she's not causing mayhem. I have some treats ready. I actually just have her kibble. And I have some toys available too on the table there. So um, if you have a dog with you and you wanna play along, just find a toy that your dog likes, like a tug toy or a ball. And my puppy likes both. All righty. So I have a tug toy here. You can tell she's really into it or she's really interested in it. She's tracking it with her eyes. Um, I love playing tug with my dog and I, I do the exact same thing with a ball or a disc. So whatever toy you have is great. If your dog's not into toys, get a piece of food. I'm gonna demonstrate with all options. So the thing to look for is eye contact and it's kind of hard to see, but let's say I just start playing with her. Like I just wave the toy in her face and start playing. There's nothing wrong with that, but she's not, I'm not going to be able to control it in the way I want to stop her from chasing things in the future. Instead, what I want to teach her is to look at me and pause before I allow her to play. So there are two things in play here. One is you're going to look for your dog's eye contact. Two is you are going to say a word that means you can play now. Some people use okay. Some people say free or get it or tug, pick a special word and it, you only use it with your dog when you want to tell them you have permission now. So just for the sake of demonstration, I'm gonna hold the toy way out and watch her eyes. So I don't know if you can see on the video, but she's flicking her eyes back to me. When her eyes are on me, I'm gonna give her the release cue and start playing with her. Tug. Yeah, you see how quickly she got into it. So the desire is there, like the desire to lunge, to bite this thing is there, but I am teaching her to pause and to think. She needs to look for me, to me for permission before we engage in this activity together. Yeah. All right, drop, good girl. If your puppy or dog is not great at drop, maybe I'll cover it in another, or we do, we have a, actually a live stream on it. It's, I think it's called like, what's in your mouth or something like that. 
watch that one. It's all about how to get your dog to spit things out, whether it's a toy or something you don't want them to have. So let's say your dog isn't food um, toy motivated and food is their number one. Same thing. Let me see if I can reorient her. What you're going to do is you're going to hold a treat out and the moment their eyes, pu pupils meet your eyes, you're going to say free or whatever your release cue is and then drop the treat or give it to them. So I'm going to hold the treat out. She's looking at the treat. Free. She looked at me, so I said the release word and gave it to her. I'm going to do this a few times too. So I'm going to hold the treat out. She's probably going to look at the treat. Oh, you dropped it. It's right there. Ready, Paya? Free. And I threw it for her this time. All right. At the core, what I'm teaching her with this exercise is when you see something that you want, you need to pause, you need to think, and you need to check in with me first. I know this isn't a deer, this isn't a dog at Blue Mountain yet, but I will show you how this applies to those situations as we move along. Um, if you have a dog or puppy with you, go ahead and take a minute or two to practice this. Whether you have a ball or a disc or a tug or a piece of food, just look for the eye contact and then release them to get the thing. One other thing I didn't mention because she didn't perform it is let's say your dog tries to jump up instead of look at you. What you should do is just calmly lift the thing away. So just lift it away and that's gonna cause them to stop jumping. They're gonna learn if I try to get it without permission, she's not even gonna do it. It just doesn't work because the thing they want moves away. So do that. Um, if you don't have a dog or puppy, just keep watching my screen because I'm gonna keep demonstrating for a moment. So let's do food first. So while well, I dropped one, I was reinforcing the jumping. My mistake. Ready? Three. Excellent. All right, I'm not the tug toy. Tug. Yeah. You go. Too hard. I play too hard. Tug. Yeah. I need Good girl. Yeah, you got it. All right, we're going to move on to the next step. And as always, if you have questions along the way, uh, just post in the chat and I will try to answer them as we go. Any questions that I don't get to, I will give you resources at the end so that you can contact me at any time and I can answer your questions. Oh, it's gone. So I'm just going to reward her real quick. All right. So the thing, the next step, and really it's not two steps. This is actually a very complicated process and it, it doesn't happen overnight. But when you reinforce, when you wait for that eye contact, and just to repeat, you're teaching your dog to pause, to think, and to check in with you, rather than impulsively go for the thing that they want. So again, let's picture the person joyfully playing fetch with their dog in a field. I wanna reiterate, there's nothing wrong with that, but the dog just stares at the ball, the ball moves, the dog chases the ball, brings it back, and it's a very, very just self-reinforcing cycle. The dog isn't learning anything bad because in that scenario, it's just the ball that they're chasing, but they are learning to just fixate on the ball and not necessarily listen to their person, right? So um, I'm not saying that every time you play fetch with your dog, you need to do 10 minutes of training. You can add in two seconds of training simply by waiting for this eye contact before throwing the ball for them. And that's gonna cause your dog to look at you and actually just think about you a little bit, even during a high arousal game like fetch. If your dog didn't look at you immediately, or if they took, let's say 20 seconds or even one minute, that's normal. Stick with the process. I worked with a very, very high drive working dog that had very intense prey drive challenges. And no joke, it took two to three minutes for, this, for him to offer eye contact at first. But as you practice um, day to day, session to session, you're gonna see that shrink. She did not come like this. Like every puppy, she fixates on what she wants. It took practice and consistency for her to get to this point. And we're still working on it. So um, 
Step two is once your dog or puppy gets the hang of pausing, thinking, and checking in with you for permission to get what they want, you're going to increase the distraction level. So um, let me move her on the screen. So as an example, she is very used to calmly checking with me like she is doing right now instead of jumping for the toy. Now that she's good at this, I'm just going to make it a little harder. Maybe I'll move the toy down a little bit. Maybe I'll just wiggle it a little bit. I'm not going to fling it around. That's too hard. You saw her kind of sway there. But I'm teaching her to continue pausing, thinking, and checking with me, even though the distraction just got a little more challenging. Same as before, when she does look at me and make eye contact, I'm going to release her to play with me. Come. Yeah, you got it. You got it. You're so smart. You're so smart. All right, I'm going to do it again just to demonstrate. So she's already good at making eye contact with me. If this is new to you, you want to stay at step one for a while until your puppy is very consistently calming down and offering eye contact. And now I'm gonna make it a little harder. I'm just gonna move it around a little more. So I'm still gonna wait for her to check in with me before I release her to play. Come. Yeah, you got it. Oh. I'm not gonna have you guys practice this unless your dog is at step two, but I'm gonna show you the progression that I went through with Kaya. And this was over days or even weeks. All right, ready? Good. All righty. So the distraction levels increase. Yeah. Good girl. And let's increase it again. Get it. Yeah. You Drop. Yes. Ready? Let's increase it one more level. Good job, screen. Sweet. Look at her eyes. Oh, she thought that was the release cue. So that, because I was talking to you, watch her eyes. I'm going to do it one more time. Notice when she went for it before the release cue, I pulled it away. I didn't let her have it. That's all you need to do. All right. I am using a weight cue, which um, it's not a stay like you would learn in an obedience class. It means pause and give me eye contact. All right. Wait. Yeah, you got it. Awesome. Um, like I said, this is complex. Adding that cue, and I can talk about cues all day. All of that is not important. Where you should start, if this is new to you, is simply taking the toy that you play with your dog all the time and waiting for them to give you eye contact before releasing them to play with the toy. As simple as that. And the buildup it takes a little while and that's why we do private lessons. <laughs> but if you have the gist of it, absolutely, you can practice. And I hope you see a lot of success with this. So um, we talked about this really simple core skill to get your dog pausing and thinking rather than impulsively going after what they want. We talked about, uh, I showed you a demo of how you would make this harder and more, um, well, increase your criteria over time. And I'm just going to switch gears here real quick. So let me get a chew for her, and I'm going to talk about the next stages of teaching your dog not to chase things. Oh, good girl. Get that. So now she's chewing on something. I have all these toys. Notice they're not on the ground. They share other toys on the ground. The interactive toys were, that I can use for this training are only for when we play together. So if your dog's ball obsessed, play ball with them, but don't just leave them everywhere. You want to use it to channel that prey drive and control it. All right. So um, how does this apply to deer, you might ask? 
So horses or dogs, you know, if your dog just runs at the dog, they're blue mound. How does this apply? When your dog impulsively runs after something, whatever it is, the issue is not that they like dogs, right? Or that they like deer, eh. but the issue is that they don't think to stop. They just go after what they want. So we can't control what other people are doing with their dogs. We can't control deer or rabbits or where the cars are driving on the road, but we can control how our dogs sees a situation in which there's something that they want that's moving. So when you do use things that you can control, such as discs, balls, food, whatever it is that really makes your dog's eyes glow, and you do this practice, you will help them generalize to realistic situations. I'm not saying that if your dog can pause when you're throwing a ball, that they will pause when they're chasing a deer, but that's certainly more effective than just working on coming when called in your living room. Um, and when you play with your dog, you mimic high arousal situations. So um, when you call your dog from sitting on their bed in the living room, that's great, but it's a really common situation. If you can call your dog off of chasing a ball, that's very, very similar to chasing a deer if your dog is very ball driven. So that's why we do that exercise. But we also want to do work on um, conditioning your dog to respond to a stop cue. So this is, there's an entire live stream on coming when called. So you can go watch that. I'm not gonna focus too much on that, but absolutely coming when called is an important skill. It's not the number one skill, because if I am training the way I want, my dog isn't gonna chase deer without permission to begin with, but dogs aren't robots, dogs will chase things. So when they do chase, I want to be able to stop them. This is not, this is like plan B. Plan A is what we just did. Plan B is coming when called or stop, no stop, it's moving. You know, that, whoa, whatever cue, the word doesn't matter. This is gonna be a little repeat from coming when called. Um, and, this is so simple. This is so much easier than what we just did. Pick a word. The word should mean stop in your tracks. And whatever word you want that to be, all you need to do is jackpot your dog or puppy when they hear the sound. So when I say jackpot, I mean a reward that's very valuable and long lasting. So I'm not gonna do it with this because it's still frozen, but um, my dog that I had a long time ago who passed away, he was so obsessed with eating deer carcasses and he chased deer, I'll show you a video. Um, and I could not get him to come when called, but then I thought he's not responding because he's chasing deer and he likes to eat them. Why don't I use deer to train him? And lo and behold, he came when called like a dream once I figured out what really motivates him and used it to my advantage. I'm gonna demonstrate this once. It's gonna be so easy. So I'm gonna find something that's really valuable. I don't wanna use my dog's kibble. That's not valuable. That's, that's something, something my dog gets every day. So let me root around a little bit. Uh, I actually need to root around a little more. Over there, I'll be right back. Okay, so in this little pouch, I have something I used this morning for training. I have cut up pieces of, I guess, cheese, okay, and dehydrated deer liver and lungs. My puppy does not get this for free. She does this. She's already at my heels. Um, <laughs> she gets this when we are practicing recall or that stop cue. So all you need to do if your dog or puppy is new to this is get a handful of this, enough for it to last 15 to 20 seconds of eating. And you're just gonna say your word in your natural tone of voice as you would if your dog was chasing a deer in real life right now. You would just drop a handful of food in front of them. All right, so I'm gonna show you. It is okay, like let's say she's a new dog, I just got her today. It's okay that she's right in front of me. Come. And I just scattered it and there she goes, she's eating. That's all it takes. I only do this. I mean, I've had Haya for since November 14th. I've only done this 10 times and her recall is so great. I'm gonna show you some videos because you want it to be special. For this, I use the word come, you can say, whoa, you can say stop, whatever your word, you just drop that handful of food. 
You want it to be special. You want the treat to be very special and you want it to be long lasting. Oh, she's already done with it, which is fine. <laughs> but um, when, when you take a class, even with me, and we talk about Kung Lu and Called and we practice 20 times in the classroom, that's good for learning the mechanics of the skill. But to build that turn on a dime desire to stop in their tracks or come to you, you need the quality of your training to matter more than the quantity of your training. So that's why this jackpot is really, really powerful. All right. Um, if you have a dog in your room, go ahead and maybe find like some rotisserie chicken or a slice of cheese and you can just jackpot them. In the meantime, I'm gonna answer some really excellent questions in the chat. Ooh, I'm sorry that my voice is cutting in and out. I hope the problem is better now. Um, two great questions. One is what age to expect a puppy to learn this? How much time a day to spend on this kind of training? Uh, I started with her immediately. I mean, socialization is the most important thing for a puppy, but the eye contact thing, I don't spend 15 minutes doing that, but if I spend 15 minutes simply playing with Paya, I am also incorporating that skill while I play with her. And um, the coming, uh, the stop slash coming when called conditioning, like I said, I only do it, I do it like once a week and it's really effective because it's novel and powerful. Another great question is, can an older dog be trained with the same procedure? Absolutely. Um, my older dog, who I no longer have, successfully chased deer, porcupine, other dogs. He treated a black bear and the rattlesnake. Um, and I didn't know what I did now. I didn't know then what I do now. Um, so I didn't teach him not to chase, but I, his recall is excellent. And I've also worked with dogs in our community who have successfully chased deer, killed deer, eaten deer, chased cars, chased people, chased dogs, shelter dogs who do this too. And absolutely, it is effective. A dog is never too old to learn. Great question through and through. All right. So th this is a very complex topic. I can talk about this for hours. Um, and we do entire packages of private lessons focusing solely on teaching dogs to be off-leash reliable. And a big part of that is not chasing things. But I want to just give you today, tonight, the most condensed critical pieces of information. So now I'm going to show you some videos of exactly how I implement everything I just talked about in real life with my dogs. Um, and actually, because I'm showing you videos, give me one moment, I'm just going to put her in her pen and then show you the videos. So there we go. Oh, I'm just going to look out. Oh, cute. I'm going to give her her little chew in there. Demo dog. Don't tell Brad I said that. All right. Back to me. All right. So um, let me show you some videos of real life situations. And I am going to share screen now. Okay. Video number one. And I'm going to explain the videos first before I show it to you. Video number one is me walking my older dog Bray around a deer. Now I never ever go into people's yards. I don't encourage my animals to chase wildlife, but everything I just talked about, you know, controlling the resource like a ball, practicing with those controlled resources, very important, but also because we have the privilege of living in Montana, if you can safely and respectfully find deer to train around, that's gonna be your best bet. You're either going to find them and control how you interact with them, or they're going to find you when your dog is off leash and surprise you and your dog may go off chasing them. So the thing to look for is my dog is interested, but because of all our training, he pauses, he thinks, and he turns away from the deer and comes along with me. Oh. What a good boy. All right, really short clip. Um, and I don't have a video of me calling Bray off deer. I've been trying to get one for ages. He's just too good. I mean, he's going to be four at the end of January. I've done everything that I talked about today since he was a puppy. 
and I just can't get him. Well, he has chased deer on O'Brien when he was really young and wasn't with me. But um, ever since then and further training, I just can't get him to do it. I can't get a video of it. He's too good. So next video is channeling that prairie drive in another way. So I'm using a floor pole, which is like a wand toy for a cat but for a dog. The thing to note is that I look for eye contact, which you're not gonna be able to see because it's dark, um, before I release her to play and chase and exercise that prey drive, I also practice a woe or a stop, teaching her in a controlled situation to snap out of that prey drive mode and respond to me instead. So you can't hear it because I'm farther from the camera, but I released her to go play. And I'm just gonna skip ahead because I let her win this time. And I'm gonna skip ahead to the point where I practice having her stop chasing. Notice there's a dog running in the background. She's on a leash or a long line, so I can stop her. I think it's here, let's see. So I gave her permission, now she's playing. Love it. So that's my stop cue. In the future, if she's running too far off trail or if she's going after something, I just want her to pause. I'm gonna use that word. And you notice how she just paused right there. And I was ready to reward her with the jackpot for pausing. So there's an implementation in the real world. Um, this video is a more advanced version of, or not a more advanced version. It's showing you how I implement that jackpot stop or recall cue in a controlled high arousal situation. So how do I know after all of this practice that when I say come, she's gonna to come to me instead of running after another dog? Well, I'm gonna practice with a controlled moving thing like a toy before I test it on other dogs. I'm gonna to skip to maybe the middle because some of it, I'm just training her to bring things back. Oh, oh, there we go. Eye contact. Excellent. I love it. So all of the, everything that I just demoed, I'm doing, right? Like I hold the toy out. She needs to calm down and look at me first. I don't care about the sit. She just happens to sit. There's really the eye contact and the pause. I give her the release cue, which is get it in this case. And she turned on a dime when I asked her to come. That's exactly what I want her to do if she's chasing a deer. All right, next video, we're almost done here. Ooh, okay. Um, I don't have a video of Bray doing this as a puppy, but I'm just gonna show you a quick clip. Awesome, so same thing. Well, the recall or the stop cue, that's what I'm demonstrating here. Just mid running after this dog, who's a friend's dog, I call him off. He pauses with me and then I release him to go engage. Um, I'm actually gonna show you one other short little clip here. This is BNRC, eye contact. So watch this. Awesome. So same concept. It's just not a ball. It's not a toy. It's not food. Same exact steps, but now it's a real dog. He needs to pause, calm down, think, look at me, and then I give him permission to go group that dog if I want to. Now, if I don't, it's fine because he's already calm, focused, and thinking about me. All right. Almost done here. All right. And then this is the only real life clip I have. Like I said, I don't encourage my dogs to chase wildlife. And when it does happen organically, I mean, Soro did chase a lot of wildlife in his life. Um, I, my first instinct is not to take out a camera, but I had this moment. This is um, a recall off of deer. His recall was a whistle, so I whistled.
All right. And, you know, at that point in his training, I didn't need to use food because the behavior was reinforced well enough. So I'm just going to stop sharing screen share there. Okay, here I am. I'm back. Um, I, there is one other secret step. It's not a secret because I'm going to tell you, but there is one other really, really important step um, too, actually. One is you need to practice in real life environments. Everything that I just showed you, the eye contact thing, the jackpotting, do, do that in your living room and in your yard because you do need to reinforce the behaviors in a calm situation before applying it to a real world situation. But once it seems like your dog's starting to get it, it, there is absolutely no use in practicing and in your living room. You need to go out into the world and you need to practice in all the places that your dogs might see cars or horses or dogs or deer. You might even need to seek out dogs or horses or cars or deer in as controlled of a situation as possible, of course, while being respectful to our neighbors here. And um, the, the secret or the really a step that is as important as everything I just talked about is prevention of chasing. If your puppy has never chased a deer, or if your adult dog has successfully chased deer or whatever it is they have chased, successfully run up to dogs off leash when you don't want them to, you need to prevent that from happening today. The next hike you take, the next walk you take, it's not forever, but if you rewatch the stream and you watch all of my Paya clips, you'll notice there is at least a leash or a long line dragging from her at all times. I didn't even, there's a video where I call her off of the dog because I can do that now too. Um, and you know, when you watch my videos, you might think like you can, I can already do all those things with her. Why do I need to keep her on a leash? She is well-trained, which is true for the puppy owners watching this, your puppies are going to change. They're going to go through adolescence. Their desires to chase or engage are going to change. And I'm not going to make a mistake through that. And I can help it. A long line will allow me to pick up the line and prevent her from reaching the dog she wants to chase if she blows off a recall cue. Um, those of you with adult dogs, hiking with a long line is a chore, but the sooner you implement that to prevent the successful practice of chasing while you implement all of this training, the sooner you're going to have an off-leash reliable dog that doesn't chase or and or responds to coming in calls. All righty. Um, a long line, great question, is a line. Um, I will, let me show you, let me show you what a long line is because, oh, they're all in my car. Imagine a leash that is 15 to 50 feet long, depending on your needs. And um, I will post in my, oh, I will post in the comments where I got my long line from, palamiline.com, right here. Uh, just an example of what a long line is. Just a long leash, just so you can stop your dog um, more conveniently than having to catch them, which we know is impossible. So if, let me see if there are other questions here. Again, if I don't answer your questions right now, um, please feel free to email me or call me because we are here to help. We have a free behavior helpline. The last thing I'm going to share with you is um, how to reach us if you need further help. So let me pull that up. Thank you so much for being here today. This is one of my favorite topics, if you can't already tell. I backpack and hike and paddleboard and we're all over. We are at DNRC and the Clay and Blue Mountain and O'Brien and all of the, in the Bitterroot. I do all the things that you wanna do with your dogs, which is why this real world training and implementation of these skills is as important to me as it is to you. So here's all of our information. I think I'm screen sharing right now, am I? I think I am. Um, you can email us at behavior at myhswm.org. We are happy to answer any questions about training and behavior. Every Wednesday at six o'clock, we have a puppy class. Tonight's topic just happened to be very broad because tomorrow is New Year's Eve and we do not have a behavior spotlight. But through the winter, every Wednesday and Thursday at six o'clock, we have these free behavior information sessions. Um, as always, we are just so, it's such a privilege to be able to help people and dogs in our community. We are a privately funded nonprofit. If you would like to make a donation, um, it goes to the care of our shelter pets. That's all I have for you tonight. Thank you so much for joining me and I hope you have a great night and a great New Year's.